All right. Well, time for some more, um, some more of you watching me talk about physics. So, uh, yeah. This lecture is going to be about gases, mainly gases, um, and then we'll touch on plasma and plasmas at the end. So we've already talked about solids and liquids and how all these things are just made up of atoms and atoms in different sort of varying forms of freedom and whereas solids are pretty confined to the uh, sort of structure that they're in, the atoms jiggle around but they're stuck in that sort of structure. It's liquids, uh, the atoms are much more free to move around each other uh, but they're still sort of confined to the volume of the liquid. Um, so a little bit more freedom of movement. And finally, gases is essentially the state where the atoms are just entirely free to move around, um, or almost nearly entirely free to just move around. And there's no real sense, unless you have some gas in a container, that a gas is going to be just like stay in its own sort of a state together. And gas will just go around. Right. So um, a couple things about gas and gases in general. Um, Gases are uh, free to move around, and they just fill up whatever space they're in. And unlike uh, solids and liquids, which are both basically incompressible, gas uh, and gases are uh, compressible. So if you have a container of gas, then you can generally squeeze it down, at least to a large extent. In liquids, if you imagine taking a full water bottle and capping it off, fill to the brim, cap it off, and try to squeeze it, you're going to have a very hard time squeezing it, getting any more than a little tiny bit of movement. So that's that nearly incompressible nature of the liquid. Whereas with gases, you take a bottle, but it's uh, empty it out. When you empty it out, there's actually just air in that uh, bottle. So you close off the cap, there's air in there, so there's gas, there's gas in there. And you can actually squeeze it down quite a bit. Um, at some point, you squeeze it down so much that, uh, as we'll talk about later, the pressure in the gas increases and it becomes very hard to squeeze it anymore. Right? But for a, a large degree, you can compress the gas down. So some just examples of gases. Uh, you know, a very common form of uh, gas is uh, steam, gaseous H2O. And this is exhaust. Um, could also be water vapor. It might be some other kind of gas, but you know, clouds are a form of uh, gas generally too. And then, yeah, finally, just our sort of uh, diagram of a gas is all of these atoms. Again, atoms are what make up matter, and gas is just another form of matter or form that matter can take. And um, in gases, all the gases, the atoms make up the gas are just freely flying around in all sorts of directions. And also, as indicated by the little arrows, those arrows are sort of meant to indicate the velocity of each of those gases. And recalling that velocity is a vector, and those, the length of those arrows indicates the speed of the atom, or the, each of those individual atoms, right? The velocity for all of those is, you know, pointing in all kinds of directions. It's, all, it's also varying in speed. Um, or how fast they're actually moving in those directions. So some of them moving slowly, some of them moving very quickly, most of them probably somewhere in the middle, sort of an average speed. And that will come back later when we talk about temperature. So, as I mentioned already, uh, the air that we're breathing, and it's, it's all around us, um, is a gas. And it's the, well, the most common form of gas that we experience. It is made up mostly of uh, nitrogen, dinitrogen, N2, uh, so a molecule of nitrogen, and oxygen, O2, a molecule of oxygen. Um, so it's a mixture of those gases, most of those gases. There's other trace gases too in there, but for the most part it's nitrogen and oxygen. So what is the properties, what are sort of properties that does air have? So, you know, we started out talking about solids and talking about the density of solids and then talked about uh, liquids, and we talked mostly about pressure in terms of liquids, but I mentioned also that, you know, density is also a property that a uh, liquid will have, just uh, the mass of whatever liquid, and divided by the volume of that liquid, that's the density of the liquid. Um, so similarly for air, air is, has a density as well, and all gases are going to have a density too, and again, it's the same concept, you just take 
the total mass of the gas that you have divided by the volume that that gas is taking up, and there you go, you have the density of the gas. So if you recall, the density of water, or liquid H2O, is one gram per cubic centimeter. Right? So in a cubic centimeter like this, almost like the size of a die, uh, gram, I don't know, in terms of English measurements or standard measurements, I think a gram is maybe like uh, a couple of teaspoons. I, I don't know. Standard measurements are so weird. Anyway, you know, if you can imagine a small little cube of water, you could probably imagine about how much it weighs. It's a gram. That's what we call gram. In terms of air, though, if you have a little like dice almost uh, size a cube of air, but it's a little bit smaller than a die, um, so it would be a cubic centimeter. The density of air is about 0 0.001 grams per cubic centimeter, or 100,000th, 1,000th of a gram per cubic centimeter, which also actually translates to if you had a cubic meter, so a meter is about three feet, so a cubic meter, if you had a cubic meter, uh, of air is approximately is going to be approximately one kilogram of mass, okay. and a kilogram roughly translates to I think about two pounds. It doesn't. It's standard measurements. But yeah, you could say that in a cubic or roughly a cubic yard um, of air, there's about two pounds worth of uh, matter there. Nitrogen and oxygen. So just comparing those two, uh, water is about a thousand times denser than air. And while the weight of air is small, it's not negligible. Um, it's not something you just entirely ignore. Uh, for example, the weight of the air in an average room is roughly comparable to uh, your own weight. Maybe not quite like a bedroom, but maybe more like a sort of a lecture room or a conference rooms, things like that, so the volume of that room is maybe about roughly a thousand times the volume of you, and since you are mostly made up of water, your density is roughly the same as water, so being a thousand times bigger in volume than you, the room, the, wa the weight of the room in the air is roughly equal to the weight of yourself. So it's not nothing, it's certainly something. And we're going to dive more into what that means, that air does have that. The fact that we live in this environment that has air, it has nitrogen, it has oxygen, and it's a gas, it's all around us. We essentially, what we call that gas that pervades the, around the surface of the Earth, we call that our atmosphere. Right? And like I mentioned at the end of the last lecture, uh, gases are very similar to liquids in that they both act as fluids. They both flow. They both can move freely in a uh, very general sense. In that sort of analogy or that uh, metaphor in a way, um, we, on the surface of the uh, Earth, we're living in essentially the bottom of an ocean of fluid. And that fluid is the air, the gas that makes up the air, and the ocean is uh, what we call our atmosphere. So combine all that together, all that air is what we call our atmosphere. So just like then when we talk about the pressure in a liquid, you know, the pressure gets greater and greater as you get deeper and deeper into the liquid. The same thing applies for uh, gases. As you drop deeper and deeper into a gas, the pressure is going to get greater and greater. And that, that pressure, in the same way as uh, the pressure in a liquid, is due to the weight of the liquid above it, the pressure in the gas is the same. It's due to the weight of the gas that's above you. It's all that gas pressing down, and in the end, that amounts to a pressure that pushes in all directions. And so another way of saying that is, you know, since we live at essentially the bottom of this ocean of air, you know, we're at sea level here. Well, there are places that are maybe even deeper below sea level, but sea level, for the most part, we'll say is the deepest in the um, atmosphere we can go. So that's going to be the place where we're at the greatest pressure, right? We're the deepest in this ocean that we can go, in this fluid of air that we can go. And what that means is that if you go up in this fluid, if you uh, get uh, into higher and higher altitudes, um, 
you're getting less and less pressure. You're getting to a place with less and less pressure because there's less and less gas uh, the, the, in, that makes up the atmosphere that is above you to cause that pressure. So it, it turns out that most of the atmosphere is within about the first uh, 10 kilometers or about six miles um, from the Earth's surface. So if we look at this image here, we see that um, you know going from sea level, uh, this first sort of layer is uh, what we call the troposphere, and that's up to about 10 kilometers, and it's probably something, I don't know, it doesn't actually show on here, um, it's more than half the atmosphere is below this level, and at 10 kilometers, I'm guessing it's maybe about 80, 75 or 80 percent of the atmosphere is below there, so, um, and it staggers, it gets uh, less and less dense as you go further and further up, all the way up to even up to 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers, there's still uh, atmosphere there, but it's very uh, diffuse. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to calculate what the pressure is due to the air above us, due to the atmosphere. And we can do that by taking the fact that, you know, we'll say most of the air is, or most of the atmosphere goes up to only 10 kilometers. And what we need to know if we're going to figure out what the pressure is at sea level, say the pressure on a square meter, right? we need to know the force of the atmosphere that's pushing down and use that one square meter to say pressure is that force divided by uh, the area. Okay? So take our one square meter and imagine like extending this column or thinking about looking at this column of air uh, that's one square meter around goes all the way up to the top of the atmosphere. Right? So it's the weight of all of that air in that column that's pushing down on this square meter. So the volume of that would be one square meter multiplied by the height of the atmosphere, 10,000 uh, meters. So we get 10,000 cubic meters and um, the mass of that, if we look at, use the density of air, turns out to be 10,000 kilograms. And the weight of that air, again, remember if we have mass here on Earth, we just multiply by the acceleration of gravity, we were gravitation pull, and that is 10, about 10 meters per second per second. So 10,000 kilograms multiplied by that 10 uh, meters per second squared gives us 100,000 newtons. So that's the weight, that's the force of all of that air pushing down on the square meter. So again, find the pressure on that one square meter. We would say the pressure is equal to that force, 100,000 newtons divided by the area, one square meter. So we end up getting 100,000 newtons per square meter, or remember it's 100,000 pascals. In terms of standard units, this turns out to be 15 pounds per square inch. Yeah, so I, gave, I told you that, I think in the last uh, lecture we talked about pressure to begin with, that this is the pressure of the atmosphere. So here I'm just showing you that this is roughly how you can calculate that that's approximately what that pressure is going to be, just knowing the density of the atmosphere, essentially. And for sure, just to point out that this is an oversimplification, but it's fairly, it's pretty accurate on average throughout all of the Earth's surface. Right? So 100,000 pascals, that's the pressure. So that's essentially also, the, you know, the pressure of just anywhere along the surface, pressure that's exerted on you, it's exerted all over your body. So remember that the pressure in a gas, just like in a liquid, because they're both fluids, the pressure exerts in all directions. So that, that 100,000 pascals is pressure that's exerting on all parts of my body right now, right? Except for the bottoms of my feet. All right, well... Now we get to some of the fun part. We're going to see some demonstrations of this pressure, right, of the atmosphere. We call it atmospheric pressure. So one way to see uh, the fact that the atmosphere has this pressure is to take a cup of water and place a flat surface, like you want a nice a flat rimmed uh, cup. There shouldn't be any gaps in it. Um, place a flat piece of uh, cardstock or just folded paper or uh, anything that's uh, flat um, that can essentially touch on all the rim of the cup at once. So you fill up the, the cup, 
put the piece of paper on there, put whatever your flat surface is on there, you flip it over, and you jiggle your hand, and the water doesn't fall down. Why is that? Well, the main reason is that the what's pushing down on, if you have, say, a piece of paper open above the cup, or on the rip top of the cup, what's pushing down on that paper is the weight of the water in the glass, but what's pushing up is the atmospheric pressure, right? So the weight of the water multiplied by that surface area is not very much, actually, as, at least in comparison to the pressure um, of the air pushing on the other side of that. So let's see that in action. So he dyed his water red. So that's atmospheric pressure pushing up on that uh, piece of paper and the water, the weight of the water trying to push down on it. And atmospheric pressure wins. All right, so another example of atmospheric pressure and how great it actually is, how much pressure it actually is, is, or you can see that with uh, these things they call Magnuver, Meg I think, hemispheres, um, named after some person, I'm sure, who came up with this idea. But essentially, you can take uh, like a sphere and slice it in half, so you have two hemispheres, and essentially just hook up a valve to one of the hemispheres, and the valve so you can open it and you can close it, and connect that valve to a pump. So when you uh, put the spheres together, if the valve is open or closed, initially it doesn't really matter because right, when you put the spheres together, all you're doing is enclosing the air that's already there. That air is at atmospheric pressure. The air outside of the spheres is at atmospheric pressure, so there's no pressure difference between the inside and the outside. You just pull the spheres back and forth. You put them together, pull them back and forth. However, when you connect the valve to a pump, what that pump is going to do is essentially pull or um, yes, yeah, in a way, it's going to pull the air, some of the air molecules that are inside of that those hemispheres, that sphere, out of them, right? So it's sort of a one-way thing. It's just kind of taking some of that uh, nitrogen and oxygen out of there. And what that does is since there's now less uh, atoms in there, the pressure um, inside of that is lowered, and meaning it's lower than atmospheric pressure. So now, inside of the sphere, the pressure is lower. Outside, it's still atmospheric pressure. It's still higher than that. And the effect of that is that essentially the pressure of the atmosphere is pushing in uh, on the sides of the hemisphere. And so it wants it to keep it together. And even um, in this video, we'll see these two you know, grown men trying to pull these hemispheres apart, and they can't do it. So he's using a hand crank uh, pump to essentially evacuate some of the air out of this hemisphere. So you close the valve off so we don't let air go back inside. So now each of these guys is going to try to pull on the hemisphere and they're pulling apart. They're trying to force these hemisphere open but the pressure of the atmosphere is pushing them close because the pressure inside is so slow now that the difference in pressure means that overall there's a much greater force pushing the atmosphere's spheres together. Until you open up that valve, you let air back inside, it goes back to atmospheric pressure inside, atmospheric pressure outside, there's no pressure difference. Easy to pull them apart. All right, so how about one more uh, demonstration for now? How do you do it essentially the just getting an understanding of how great atmospheric pressure is. And remember that atmospheric pressure is due to the weight of all the air above you, or above whatever object you're talking about. This was an experiment that uh, uh, Mythbusters did. Mythbusters was a TV show a while ago. They tried to uh, verify or bust uh, all kinds of myths, urban legends, things like that. Um, one of those was essentially that there was a steel tanker um, something like a quarter of inch thick, thick steel um, that was cleaned out um, with a hot, 
hot water, steam, hot water and steam, and uh, the inside, so they were cleaning out the inside, and uh, after they cleaned it out, they got out of the tank, they closed it up, and when, by closing it off, they didn't allow any air to come inside or outside of the tank, and so what happens is, as the water, that steam in the air that's still inside of the tank is hot, it's at a you know fairly high pressure, but when the tank cools off, the water uh, in the air, that steam, now wants to condense and become, or sorry, the steam that's in the air, it wants to condense and become water. And as it condenses, the gas essentially is uh, contracting, and so it's becoming much smaller as it comes from a gas to a liquid, and what that really does in the end is drop the pressure very uh, significantly. So instead of the gas being everywhere and pushing on everything, you have a liquid that's not really pushing on much anymore. So essentially the pressure drops as the steam um, condenses into water. And the myth was that it was such a great pressure difference, or drop in pressure, that the difference between the pressure inside and the atmospheric pressure was enough to crush the tanker. So I think as it turned out in this myth, they weren't able to reproduce that because that, that difference in pressure just wasn't quite enough to do that. However, like their tradition was that if they couldn't reproduce the myth based on the, the, you know, the statement of the myth, then oftentimes they would just go to excess in order to reproduce the results. So what we're seeing here is the tanker and essentially They've shut off the tanker, um, closed it off, and connected it to a valve in with a pump. So the pump is pumping air um, out of that tanker. And um, what we're seeing here is the pressure gauge, which is showing us our pressure, um, yeah, the pressure in the tanker. And yeah, well, it's just making it to watch. So all they're doing is lowering the pressure inside, and it's the pressure from the outside, the atmospheric pressure is um, always pushing off, pushing down onto this, pushing in all directions. And eventually, the pressure difference becomes so great that it can crush steel. And so the pressure gauge is actually showing they only had to reduce the pressure inside to about uh, 80,000 pascals which is still about 80% of atmospheric pressure. But right around there, the tank imploded. So now we need to, uh, what we're going to talk about, suction, and how suction is not at all what most people think it is. For example, when you're drinking through a straw, right? you have a straw, you put it in uh, some liquid, and you generally you know, quote, we say you're, just, you're sucking on the straw and you're sucking the liquid up. However, this is not how uh, the world works. There is no such thing as this sucking, suction force, right? There's no sense in that there's some way that inside of you, you're actually pulling on the liquid in order to uh, get it to come up that straw. What you are doing is lowering the pressure in your mouth and in your lungs and in that sense, since your lips are around the straw too, they lower the pressure within that straw. And the result of that is that the since atmospheric pressure is still pushing on all the rest of the liquid, right? It's still pushing on the liquid wherever your straw is not in there. Then the atmospheric pressure is pushing down here. It's pushing that liquid. It's causing pressure in that liquid. And since there's a lower pressure now inside of the straw, that liquid is going to get essentially pushed up by the atmospheric pressure and allowed to rise to that lower pressure area. So there you go. That's how straws work. We're going to get more into this. So this is related in a way to uh, something you call Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law essentially says that the density of a gas is going to increase as you compress that gas, or as you decrease the volume. Okay, so compressing means you're squeezing, you're decreasing this volume. So as the density of the gas increases, right, as you squeeze that gas, the pressure in that gas is also going to increase. So as an example in this image, or this kind of diagram here, if you have a syringe, and that syringe is connected to a tank, so there's air in the syringe, there's air in the tank, and that uh, those things are connected to a pressure gauge, 
when you push the syringe in, what you're doing is you're compressing that volume of gas. It's going to increase that density of the gas. It's going to increase the pressure in that gas. Okay? So what you'll do if you push the plunger in, you'll see that pressure gauge go up. The opposite is also true. If you decrease the pressure in a gas by, say, expanding the gas, you uh, decrease the density of the gas by opening up the volume and allowing it to expand into a greater volume. So you decrease the, the pressure, you decrease the density of the gas. Another way of putting that is also that the pressure of a gas is going to decrease as the volume increases. In the opposite sort of way here, if we already push that syringe in, you see the pressure go up. If we were to do the opposite and pull the syringe out, we were to expand the volume of that gas, the density of that gas is going to go down, the pressure is also going to go down. Right? You can see that uh, gauge go down. So this is very much related to how humans and most other mammals, I think, and other number of other organisms, how we uh, respirate, how we breathe. In terms of breathing, again, it's a sort of a misconception, or maybe not misconception, but just not uh, misnamed in a way, that um, you might sometimes uh, say that you suck air in, especially if you've been holding your breath for a while, like you've been swimming underwater for a while or something, and you pop out of the water, and you finally, you're almost out of breath, and so you kind of like are gasping for air, you're sucking air into your lungs. Right? Remember, there's no sucking there's nothing like that. Right? What is happening? Well, we just got to remember that outside in the air, the air is going to be at atmospheric pressure. Right? And our lungs, um, along with uh, our diaphragm, work. Well, the diaphragm actually does most of the work. It's a muscle that we can contract and expand. And in, say, contracting the diaphragm, right, it pulls down, it uh, expands the volume of the lungs. And it, because of that well, long lines of Boyle's Law, when you expand the volume of the lungs, you're lowering the density of the air that's in your lungs, the gas that's in your lungs. You're lowering the pressure of the gas that's in your lungs. Right? Now that there's lower pressure here, the higher pressure of the atmosphere essentially forces more air into your lungs. So you don't suck air in, the atmosphere shoves it into you. Yeah, essentially. Um, and then so when you exhale, Right, you sort of expand your diaphragm and relax your diaphragm. What that does is it pushes back up on the lungs, right? It compresses the air, the gas that's in your lungs. That compression leads to a higher pressure, which is now greater than atmospheric pressure. So that now the pressure inside is greater than the pressure outside, and the air is forced out. So, in a sense, you kind of spew air out, but you don't suck air in. All right, so let's maybe see an example kind of along these lines. Not necessarily along the lines of changing volume, but uh, changing the pressure in some area and watching the pressure of the atmosphere um, cause something else to move. So in this case, um, you can do this if you take a hard-boiled egg and a bottle where the bottle, the opening of the bottle is a little bit too small for the hard-boiled egg. So you know you can rest the hard-boiled egg in the bottle, but it's not going to fall in. What we can do is, well, what we really want to do is essentially cause the air that's in the bottle underneath the egg to be at a lower pressure, sort of like you opening, uh, contracting your diaphragm and opening up your lungs, um, expanding your lungs in order for the air to, the atmosphere to force air in. Uh, right, so we want to lower the pressure in that bottle, and the way that we can do that, or one way you can do that, is just take a match or um, light up a piece of paper. And you drop that piece of paper into the bottle and put the hard-boiled egg on top. Okay. What the it's a slightly complicated, but what that's going to do is that the the flame is going to heat up the air inside. We haven't talked about that much yet, but um, heating up gas actually increases the pressure of the gas. So when you heat up the air that's inside the bottle, it's at a higher pressure than the air that's outside, and so that air wants to rush outwards. It wants to push out against the atmosphere. And it does that. You can actually see that. You see the egg start to uh, get pushed up a little bit as the air inside is forced outwards. But once that um, paper goes out, you're no longer heating up that gas anymore. It cools back down to its normal sort of uh, temperature. And now there's less air in there. It's less dense. It's at a lower pressure than the air outside, than the atmosphere. 
So now we have difference in pressure from the outside to the inside. The higher pressure outside is going to push down on the egg. It's going to shove that egg into the bottle. There you got the egg. It's going to light up this piece of paper. Drop it in there, and you can watch. You can see the egg sort of bobble around, right, as the air comes out. Ta -da! The egg got sucked in. Kind of cool. So just to say that, you know, like with all these demonstrations, these little videos that I show you, you know, all the links are always there, so feel free to pause this video and go check those out in more detail if you ever want. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about increasing and decreasing density of gas by expanding and contracting it, or a little bit in that demo by heating it up, cooling it down, and from the last lecture on liquids, we talked about dense uh, buoyancy and how if you have an object that the average density of that object is less than the density of the liquid that it's in, it's going to be buoyant, it's going to float. The same thing actually applies to gases, right? Because gases and liquids are fluids, they both act in this way, and you can also you can be buoyant in a gas just as you can be buoyant in a liquid. The same reasoning applies, or the same thought process sort of applies, is just that you have to have an object that is uh, has a lower average density than the air around it. So how do you do that? Well, uh, you can do that in a couple of ways. For one, you know, you can just fill up a blimp with a gas that is lighter than air. So you have a helium filled uh, blimp. Helium is lower density than the atmosphere. And with that much helium, it averages out with the balloon and well, whatever modular uh, holding tank is below that uh, the average density of that object is less than the density of the air, and that object is buoyant. Um, so similarly, actually, now that I think about it, hot air balloons uh, might be even more similar to that uh, uh, flame in the bottle, in that when you heat up that air in the bottle, it actually wants to push the air out, overall leaving the gas that's left in there to be at a lower uh, uh, density, less pressure. All right, so the last sort of overall thing I want to say about gases is another way that um, the pressure in a gas can uh, decrease. And that is, well, it has to do with Bernoulli's principle, that was uh, uh, put uh, down in detail by this guy Bernoulli, which is that the speed of a fluid is related to the pressure in that fluid. Right? So imagining like a wind rushing along, the greater the velocity of the wind, the faster that wind is moving, the lower the pressure is in that uh, wind. Right? So Bernoulli essentially says that in general, that for any uh, fluid, gas or liquid, if the speed of the fluid increases, the, move, the uh, amount that it's moving increases, um, the pressure in that fluid is going to decrease. So this is the same being, you know, applies to all fluids, gases, uh, liquids, plasmas, in a sense, um, you know, we talked about energy and energy conservation, or the conservation of energy. In a sense, you could understand this as sort of a conservation of energy, where if I imagine just a little, like a chunk of gas or a volume of gas here, the gas, all the gases are moving around randomly, but if the overall, the gas is not moving in a bulk sense, like it's not like a thing of wind moving along, it's just kind of in this area, then on average, there's no net sort of kinetic energy. All of the motion is sort of averaged out that it's all saying staying in the same area. Right? However, if you then have all that gas start moving along in one direction, right, then now all that gas, there's a net kinetic energy to that gas. And where did that energy come from? Well, the energy in a sense was taken away from the pressure of the gas, right, from the amount that the gas is uh, pushing in all directions. So that's one way of understanding for Bernoulli's principle. And yeah, so just some very simple diagrams. If you have still air, then it's going to be at atmospheric pressure, versus if you have wind, it's going to be at a lower pressure than atmospheric pressure. Right? We're not being quantitative here, just atmospheric pressure and lower than atmospheric pressure or higher than atmospheric pressure. And then the faster the wind moves, the lower that pressure is going to get. So let's see a demonstration of this, right? And you can do this on your own as well. Very easy. We can do this by taking a piece of paper, right? And if I just hold the piece of paper at its ends, 
Then it's going to flop down. Right? Not a trick piece of paper or anything like that. And so Bernoulli's principle says that if I manage to get the air moving faster along the top here, then it's going to be at a lower pressure, also meaning that the air below it's going to be at a higher pressure, and that difference in pressure amounts to a uh, force overall that's going to push this paper up. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. There you go. All right, so you can do that on your own too. Ooh. Yikes. Well, I did it at least once. I don't know. Well, there you go. Right? The light. Yeah. So there you go. The movement of the air, and that bulk sort of movement, means there's lower pressure in the air here, higher pressure in the air below it. Overall, there's a force pushing that uh, piece of paper up. It's a nice, easy one to do on your own. How about a little check for yourself, uh, having to do with Bernoulli's principle and difference in pressure when you have a lot of wind movement. So, you know, if you have a, if you're thinking about being on the ocean somewhere, and you have these little bit of uh, waves, a little bit of waves sort of building, and then you also have a strong wind blowing by, that wind again, that movement of air. It's going to cause the pressure to be lower in some areas than it is in other areas, right? So where in this picture would you say that the pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure? All right, well, it might be a little bit tricky, but essentially as the wind moves across these uh, sort of ripples, little waves, right, the wind doesn't like, isn't able to dip down as much into these sort of valleys. So the air is not going to move quite as much inside of those little dips. So largely it's going to still be at atmospheric pressure. Whereas the wind moving along the top of these waves, right, it's moving quickly along the top. So we're actually moving, uh, or actually lowering the pressure along the tops of these waves, along the crests of these waves. And this is the, you know, one way or the main sort of way of understanding why on a windy day, Waves in general are going to be much bigger than they would on a uh, calm day. Right? So on a calm day, there's still going to be waves, but when there is wind and high winds, this uh, effect of Bernoulli's principle means that uh, the bottoms, the crest, uh, troughs of the waves are still going to be sort of pushed down atmospheric pressure, but the tops of them are uh, uh, not pushed down as much because the pressure is lower than it would be on a calm day. So that lower pressure means the waves crest can get higher and higher. Um, so another uh, consequence of this uh, principle that moving air is uh, lower pressure is the roofs of buildings can be blown off, pulled off, or pushed off, pushed off more like it, um, in very high winds. So the, this diagram kind of shows this happening where if you have very high winds moving along, then that means there's a much lower pressure above the roof than there is inside of the house, because the house, the air is still still, it's still at atmospheric pressure. So essentially we now have a very a much larger pressure pushing from below than we do pushing down uh, from above. So again, the net result is that there's this force that's pushing up on the roof. And if that wind gets high enough, then that pressure is going to be very, very low. The overall that net force is going to be very great and can lift the roof off. And yeah, the, the image art happened to parts of this uh, the Superdome. Um, cool. So we could also use this principle, this fact that moving air is a lower pressure than still air in order to uh, levitate an object. And again, it's going to take my breath to do this, so hopefully it's better. So all I need for this is some kind of uh, funnel and a uh, ping pong ball, it's pretty nice, All right? So put the ping pong ball in, flip the funnel over, it falls out, right? Same amount of uh, pressure uh, above and below the ping pong ball. So the only thing, the net effect on this ping pong ball is just the force of gravity pushing it down, right? However, if I uh, blow very strongly into this uh, funnel while the ping pong ball is sitting in it, then what that's going to do is lower the pressure of the air that's above the ping pong ball, 
the pressure from below is still going to be about atmospheric pressure, so it's going to be the net effect is that there's going to be a force pushing that ping pong ball upward. And if I can blow hard enough, it's that effect of the force from the change difference in pressure is enough to counter gra the gravitational force. So let's see. Oh, that kind of worked. Okay. There you go. Right. So we've got another example of Bernoulli's principle. All right, and the final thing that's interesting to mention about um, or use of this uh, effect is in causing uh, lift and generating lift for aircrafts. So as it turns out, the way that aircrafts generate lift, well, there's a couple of different ways, but in general, the way that an aircraft is going to get, be able to get lift is due to the shape of the wings. So the shape of the wings are in this uh, particular shape, which we call an airfoil, and the, it's named as such because it has the, this particular effect, that, or this particular shape, that essentially causes the air to move over the bottom and the top of that airfoil in different ways. The shape of a wing is such that when the wing is pushing through the air, pushing through the atmosphere, the air along the top of the wing is, is sense, in a sense forced to move faster than the air that's moving below the wing. Right? So the air moving below the wing is still sort of moving at a certain rate, but this air on top is going faster than that air. So again, the net effect is that that air moving faster on the top means it's a lower pressure along the top than it is along the bottom. And the net effect of that is that there's a force upward. This is the difference in pressure amounts, uh, results in a force pushing upwards, and we call it the lift force. Yeah, this is at least one way of understanding how airplanes work. Airplanes, it's interesting if you read into them more, the, this, the effect of an airfoil is quite complicated in some, way, in some sense. But in a simple sense, Bernoulli's principle explains it in that there's just a difference in the speed of air moving above and below the wind. All right, so just wrap this uh, lecture up by, as I mentioned, we'll talk, tell you a little bit about plasma. Plasma is the fourth sort of state of matter. It is essentially, the easiest way to understand it is essentially it's a gas that has been ionized. So if you recall from the lecture on the, uh, about atoms and the atomic nature of, well, matter in the universe, that ionized uh, means um, the atoms have an electrical charge, meaning they have either an excess or a deficit of uh, electrons. Right? If you have extra electrons, that's more negative charge than your more uh, negatively charged. If you have um, a deficit of electrons, then you have less negative charge and that um, ion is positively charged. And a gas or a plasma is basically a positively ionized gas, meaning it's a gas where the atoms have lost some amount of their um, electrons. Yeah, so what ends up happening or what you end up, end up with in the end is when you have atoms that have kind of kicked off a bunch of their electrons, then we essentially have this new sort of gas where the thing that's making up the gas is now basically for the usually like the nuclei that have kicked off all of their electrons which are positively charged and then you have the electrons that are also still there but they're kind of free they're in their own sort of gas state right so we have these positive nuclei we have these negative electrons right and it's a gas sort of a mixture of those things and being that it is electrically charged Overall, each of these things is their own little electrical charge, and they're not close enough to together in the atoms to really uh, neutralize any of that overall charge. Plasmas will conduct electricity. And some examples of different plasmas, well, we have these little like plasma lamps, which are kind of fun to play with, but essentially inside that lamp, there is a gas, and the middle of the inside of that, the ball in the middle uh, is something that can put off electrical energy in order to um, give energy to the atoms in the gas. And by giving energy, you're, it's one way of knocking, essentially kicking electrons off of the atoms in that gas. Right? And when you go ahead and put your hand on the sphere, the outside of the sphere, then that 
uh, electrical energy as a path to go to, as a place to go to. So it wants to go towards your hand, which is why you end up uh, ionizing the gas in between the um, that center sphere and where you touch the outside of it. And that ionized gas is our plasma. Um, the sun is very largely made out of plasma. It's uh, so energetic that all the atoms in the sun, produce all the atoms in the sun, are not in a state where there's electrons and protons and neutrons and uh, all kind of together as atoms. They they're, uh, they're all have so much energy that the electrons are all uh, separate, essentially, from all the nuclei. Right? And there you go, that's a, that's a plasma. Um, another example of a plasma is lightning. Lightning is essentially a phenomenon, I think we'll mention, I'll mention this later on too, but where there's so much difference in energy between, uh, electrical energy between the clouds and the surface of the Earth, that um, all of the, the air in between there, maybe it's going to be difficult to explain right now, but essentially a bunch of electrons from, uh, I believe, the, uh, the cloud want to jump down to the Earth in order to sort of neutralize the difference in uh, energy between the cloud and the Earth. And that movement of uh, electrons is, in a sense, in a way, creates a plasma that uh, we see as this um, light field, right? Also, uh, arcs, or, uh, arc welders, um, you ever see an arc that's also a form of plasma. So, funnily enough, um, plasma, it's not a very common state. It's a very, it's the least common state of matter on Earth, but, if you think about it, like I said, the sun's made of plasma, and the vast majority of the uh, sort of the stuff that makes up the universe is there's tons and tons of stars, right? So stars make up a large majority of the stuff of the universe, which means that plasma is actually the most abundant state of matter in the universe, probably followed by gas after that. So some other examples of uh, plasmas would be uh, fluorescent light bulbs. So in fluorescent lights, you essentially have a gas um, inside of these tubes, and you're, uh, you essentially dump a bunch of electrical energy into those tubes so that it knocks the electrons off of the, um, the atoms in the tube, and you have a plasma, and that plasma can now conduct um, this sort of uh, path for electricity inside of the tubes. Another example are the, uh, the auroras. So the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, the aurora australis in the southern hemisphere, where the auroras are created by uh, sort of junk stuff kicked off by the sun um, that gets directed to our the poles of the Earth um, via our magnetic fields, um, which we'll talk about some more later. But essentially that, uh, that charged stuff gets shot off from the sun, it gets directed towards our atmosphere, and as it moves into our atmosphere, it crashes into the atmosphere, the atoms that make up the atmosphere, knocking off all of these um, uh, electrons from all the different atoms and creating a plasma briefly. And as that plasma sort of recombines, um, it ends up giving off light, which we see as these auroras. And so the last thing I'll show you is a little example of plasmas. So in this uh, video, each of these uh, tubes are just essentially enclosed tubes, and they each have gases inside them, hydrogen, helium, uh, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and uh, nitrogen. And all the person is going to do is they're going to bring this, uh, I think it might be a Tesla coil or something, but essentially uh, an object that can give off a bunch of electrical energy. And um, that electrical energy is very intense close to the source of that, but it fades off pretty quickly as you get away as an inverse square, uh, in fact. But, um, so that means that when you bring this source of electrical energy close to any of these one tubes, it's dumping a bunch of electrical energy into that tube. The tube is, um, the atoms in that tube are separating into nuclei and uh, electrons, and we have a plasma. And again, when that plasma sort of, just like the auroras, that plasma recombines, then we give off, it gives off photons, and actually gives off photons in a particular wavelength that's characteristic of these, each of these gases. So what we're going to see is essentially he's going to bring this uh, uh, Tesla coil, I think it's Tesla coil, by each one of these tubes, and as he brings them closer, we actually see the plasmas being formed and sort of recombining into gases.
obviously has all the uh, looks like the atomic weights on there, the atomic number at the top, number of protons, the atomic weights at the bottom. And they're not connected to anything. And here we have a nice uh, coil that can give off a bunch of electrical energy. And there you go, he turns it on. And while they're close to any of these tubes, it's giving off enough energy in that area to ionize and create a plasma in these tubes. And when that plasma recombines, we get our visible photons coming. So I don't expect you to understand or get too much about plasma. I didn't talk about plasma too much, but partly because, you know, on a day-to-day -day sense, you're probably not going to deal much with plasma, right? We deal with solids, liquids, gases. That's the most thing we deal with. Um, so I spent most of the time talking about gases and in a large part talking about atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere and atmospheric pressure, because it is extremely important. Uh, yeah. But that's all I got for this lecture. And next time, I think we're going to talk about temperature. So have a good one. I'll see you next time.